Hi there, Todd Canelon here. Good to see you today. I have a question for you right off the top. Who is it who gets the last word when it comes to you and your life? Put another way, whose opinion really matters to you? You should have some you know, typical answers coming up in your mind as I ask you this question. My wife, I care about my wife's opinion. My kids, if you have them, I care what my kids think of me. Uh, this is a constant battle for me. You're trying to raise them on the one hand, uh, so you're, your dad, you're their dad, you're not meant to be their friend. Uh, but at the same time, you do worry uh, what they think and how they feel. I worry about my kids' opinion of me. Uh, how about your best friends? Do you care what your best friends think of you? Whose opinion really matters to you? Now, take it a little broader. Let's talk about your Facebook friends. Uh, a few years back, I went through a mighty Facebook purge. I had, I don't even know, like 1,200 people on there. It just hit me one day as a result of some relational uh, difficulty I was dealing with that I'm not really friends with these people. So I went through and I just culled that list from 1100 down to a much more manageable list. What do you think about your Facebook friends? Do you really care what they think about you? If someone happens to uh, write a stinging comment to one of your posts, does it get to you? Does it hurt your feelings? Does it ruin your day? Does it upset you? I know that it can do so for me. If you are on Twitter, what about your Twitter followers or Instagram? Do you ever go and check and see if you've added any new followers? Uh, I know when I was first on Twitter, um, you, you can really notice every time you add and lose a follower. And there was a temptation to go, why? why? What did I say? In my case, it's often because I said something offensive. And so I just lose a follower. Eventually, uh, you know, you get enough people that you don't really notice. But I still have to resist the urge to dissect why it is that I've had two or three people drop me in the last couple days. Worse still, YouTube. If you put stuff up on YouTube, like I'm doing with these sermons, uh, you are at the mercy of the YouTube comments. And uh, we all live in fear of getting ripped to shreds by somebody who, for whatever reason, has decided that they hate us and our work. For me as a pastor, uh, this one is always really close to home. How do you deal with your congregants? Do you really care what they think about you? No pastor who says he doesn't care what his congregants think of him is telling the truth. Every pastor cares to greater or lesser degree. And it's a constant battle for us to try and, one, do the right thing, two, keep our sanity, three, keep you happy. And uh, there are people in churches who know that the pastor is at their mercy. And with the slightest, you know, uh, angry letter sent or ruffled email sent or phone call to the board or whatever you want to, you know, pick in terms of your uh, way to agitate the pastor, they know that they can get to him because they know that in his heart, regardless of what he says, he cares what they think of him. Whose opinion really matters to you? What about God's opinion? Do you worry about what God thinks of you? I think it's just simply true that we all want to be liked, and it's also true that we all hate to be despised. I don't know if you've ever been despised. If you never have, keep it that way. It's a much better way to live. I often uh, talk about my brother, who's a wonderful man, and people say to me, what's your brother like? Is he like you? I'm like, yeah, he's kind of like me, except everybody likes him. My brother's one of those guys that just, I don't think he has an enemy in the world. Everybody loves Jess. He's just a wonderful guy. Me, not so much. People tend to love me or hate me. If you have never been despised, you just keep that going. It's a good way to be because nobody likes to be hated. Nobody likes to be despised and everybody likes to be liked. Now, there's a really effective way that you can reduce your what do they think of me anxiety. Okay, if you've been listening to me for the last couple of minutes and you're thinking, he's right. I'm paranoid of what people think of me. Here's a way to reduce that what do people think of me anxiety. Imagine that disaster has just struck your life. Okay, so picture it in your mind. And you know, you can do this seriously. Like imagine something terrible. Your house is just burnt down. Okay? Who do you call? All right, a tornado has just struck your city and everything you own is gone. Who do you call? when the police offer you a cell phone with which to call somebody. In an emergency, who would you reach out to? I'd like to suggest that you worry about those people's opinions of you, period. Okay, the people who you would call in a disaster, you should worry about those people and not really worry about anyone else. Uh, you know, a less intense example is moving day. Okay, the people who would come to help you move, those are the people who really care about you. Now, if you're anything like me or many of the people I know who have moved one too many times, 
My wife and I think have moved 14 times in 17 years of marriage. It, it's too much. Most of that was leveraged in the first seven years of our marriage. But uh, so if you're unlike me, you've just moved, you know, once in a while. The people who show up to help you move, they're your true friends. Me, even my true friends are tired of moving. Pick those people, okay? The people who would be there when disasters strike. The people who will help you carry your extra freezer from the basements to the top floor. Those are the people about whose opinion you should be concerned. Why? Because in a battle, it's only those closest to you and the Lord, who is your help, who you should be worried about. Let's uh, finish Psalm 20. We've been here for a few weeks, and I thought we'd wrap it up today. I'll read the whole psalm to you, and we'll land on the last verses. Psalm 20, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice, Silah. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Here's our verses for today, verses 7 through 9, very famous verses. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, O Lord. May the King answer us when we call. So this is our fifth and final week in Psalm 20, which I've been saying for the last several weeks is an eve of battle hymn sung by the congregation. So this song would have been written for King David's people. They would have sung it uh, in his courts or perhaps in the tabernacle grounds on the eve of going out to fight a battle against their enemies. So this is like a, a rally song. So that was what Psalm 20 was originally intended for. We uh, made it personal last week when we explored verse 6. If you didn't watch that sermon, please go back and check it. It's called Macho God. Um, and uh, you can kind of explore verse 6 and see how this psalm gets really personal and immediate for you. Today, in verses 7 through 9, it goes uh, full-blown corporate again. So you need to picture again here the entire congregation, a huge crowd of men, we're getting ready to go out to battle. Probably their families would have been gathered somewhere in the vicinity, but the, the crush of people uh, nearest to the king would have been his soldiers. A group of men singing this, congregation, singing this song together in a congregational context. They're singing this together. I want to emphasize that. Singing this song together. I and my family are between churches right now. This is a very difficult stage for a pastor to be in. It's really no fun. Uh, you go from church to church and you're trying to find a place that feels like home. And the reality is when you're a pastor, you're kind of built for your church to feel like home. So while you're in this stage, you're just basically feeling like a stranger without a country. But uh, nonetheless, we have been getting our butts into church every Sunday, if for no other reason than to get our kids there. And for ourselves, to give ourselves an opportunity to sing in congregational worship. We've been going to a church the last two weeks that really knows how to worship the Lord. And it's just been an absolute pleasure. And it's been really good for me to stand there with my whole family in a pew. There's six of us. We take up most of a pew. And uh, as the worship rises, I stand up and I raise my hands and I sing to Jesus and I close my eyes and half of the time I end up crying. And when I open my eyes from weeping, I look over and I can see my boys watching me. And what's happening in that moment is called modeling. They're going, oh, look at our dad. He is worshiping Jesus. One of the key reasons that I make sure I go to church even when I find myself in the wilderness. And let me say to the men that I know that at the best of times, you don't want to go to church. I said to my wife uh, this Sunday, look, you know, I don't really want to go to church. And the irony is not lost on me, a pastor preacher who doesn't want to go to church. And I know that most of you men hate singing in the corporate context. The last thing you want to do is go into a room full of strangers and sing songs that you don't know to a God you only kind of believe in. But if you, as a man, are even slightly interested in pursuing the God of the Bible, and if you're even slightly interested in seeing your children learn to know the God of the Bible, you have to get your butt to church and you have to learn to embrace singing in corporate worship. Why? Because when God the Spirit gets involved as His people worship Him in the corporate context, what happens is nothing short of life-changing. I gotta say from personal experience, this is the reason that I go to church. One, to hear good preaching. 
Two, to experience the living presence of God in the context of corporate worship. Yes, I know that God is everywhere present. Yes, I know that God can speak to us on an individual level, but I know that all throughout Scripture, the example is of His people gathering together to worship Him in song together. This is what's happening here in our text today, Psalm 20. So if you have started skipping out on corporate worship, for whatever reason, stop it. Okay, because you need to sing together. What are they singing? Here's what they're singing. Look at verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. This is a very big word right off the top here, some. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is ele. Okay, some is ele. And ele means those other ones. It means them folks. It's the word for strangers, ele. Okay, those strangers, those other people, them folk. Okay, those people who are emphatically not us. That's the power of the word some in Hebrew. Ele. Those people trust in chariots. Those people trust in horses. And they are emphatically not like us. Right here, we have a differentiation in the text between us and them. Between God's people and those people. All right, now let me say, it would have been very easy for King David's people, those people who sung this hymn for the first time, it would have been very easy for them to make this differentiation because for them it's clear. Tomorrow they're going out to battle. They are literally going to fight for their lives against the enemies of God's people. So it's a us or them type situation. So in that context, it's very easy to differentiate, I think rightly, between us and them, between the good guys and the bad guys. This is very hard for us. Why? Because we are the products of a culture that wants to celebrate unity at any and all costs, right? This one word, ele, those folks, this one word is a key reason why Christianity is so problematic. Okay, this, this is why, ele, those people, this us and them differentiation lies at the heart of why Christianity can be so problematic for so many. Have you ever noticed that um, nobody hates pluralists? Okay, that's why so many people are pluralists because nobody hates them. Why is that? Well, because they're for everybody and everything. Now, the best way to combat pluralism is to push it a little bit. So next time you're at a party and someone's talking like a pluralist, and if you get into an argument or a discussion about life, God, and the meaning of the universe, uh, and it becomes clear to you that you're, they're one of these people who is just kind of for everybody and everything, push them a little bit. Oh, hey, so um, I, I hear you're a pluralist. Yeah, man. Everybody should just live and let live. All right, that's one of the phrases that they'll use. Or everybody should just be free to do whatever makes them happy. So just take it in for a second and say, accept axe murderers, right? And then you'll get this pregnant and difficult silence. Everybody should be free to do whatever makes them happy, except axe murderers. What are they going to say? Yeah, an axe murderer should be able to axe murder? Well, no, of course not. It's absurd. Axe murderers should not be allowed to axe murder. Well, that's right. Then it's just a matter of degrees. Okay, between axe murderers and red light runners, all we have is a spectrum. Okay, and somewhere along that line, between the running a red light and axe murdering someone, your friend, the so-called pluralist, draws the line. It's just a matter of where. The point is this. Everybody believes in something. Everybody believes in right and wrong. They just don't want to admit it. Why? Because once you admit to a belief system, we all intuitively know that the honest person must commit to it. Am I right? I'm right. Once you admit that you have a belief system, everybody with half a brain knows that if you admit to a belief system, the right thing to do is to commit to that belief system. And pluralists hate commitment. Right? They just do. They hate. They don't want to be nailed to the wall over anything or for any reason. Why? Because they don't want anyone to hate them. Okay? You need to figure out if you're a pluralist or if you believe in something. Why? Because the text is forcing you to do that. How? Because there's an us and them at play in our text today. Ele. Some. Those people trust in chariots. Those people trust in horses. Verse 7. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. This is amazing. Right here, you have materialism versus spiritual faith. Okay? They trust in chariots. They trust in their fancy war horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. 
materialism versus spiritual faith. I love it. They have chariots. This means that the enemy, the original audience, were to be facing the next day, were wealthier than they were. This is obvious, right? To build chariots meant you had to have an economy that could support the creation of the elements needed to make a war-going chariot. They were wealthier. They were more technologically advanced. They knew how to build a chariot. They understood the concept of how to make something roll and how to fasten it to a horse and how to have the whole thing work in the context of the melee that is a battle. This is a superior enemy that they're facing the next day. Okay, they're wealthier than them. They're more technologically advanced. They are superior. Okay, ultimately, what is materialism? Because neither you nor I are going to go out tomorrow to face death at the hands of an enemy in a chariot. So what is the point for us? Well, ultimately, materialism is what? It's a superiority contest. Okay, it starts in kindergarten. My dad is stronger than your dad. My mom is prettier than your mom. And sadly, it continues into adulthood. My car is flashier than your car. My house is bigger than your house. My wallet is fatter than your wallet. I just got to say... That this kind of behavior is disgusting, and it's non-Christian, and if you've been guilty of it, you need to stop it. I have been guilty of this, okay? I have been guilty of feeling the pressure to keep up with the Joneses. The more often I meet outstanding, incredible people who are the same age as me, the more often I am tempted to feel like I have achieved nothing with my life, and I begin feeling like a waste of time. What is that? That's just reverse pride, okay? I'm feeling like somehow I deserve what they have, because I'm better than them after all. Right? This is just materialism that has crept its way into my heart. And I'm someone who's supposed to be a man of spiritual faith, not a materialist. So if you're guilty of my dad is bigger than your dad, stop it. Okay, stop comparing yourselves to others. I'll say it again. Stop comparing yourself to others. And most importantly, stop trying to compete with them. Hilarious example. Brian, if you're watching, I got nothing but love for you, but this is what happened. Saturday... I spent four hours vacuuming my lawn with my lawnmower. The leaves were intense. My wife had said to me the day before, you know, the house is starting to look neglected, which I hear as I'm beginning to feel neglected. So I went out and I took care of business, four hours. And I said to Nikki, as soon as I finished, 10 bucks, Brian, my sweet neighbor, is going to be doing his lawn tomorrow. This just happens in a neighborhood. And sure enough, yesterday he was out doing his lawn. And I said this to him last night when we were walking the dog. I, dog, I told him about this, which is why I can tell you. Why? We just have this inbred need to keep up with each other, and that's normal. But if it were to come down to a competition, if it were to become the situation where I was measuring my um, caliber as a human being over and against what his yard looked like compared to mine, I'd be in serious trouble. Look at verse 7. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So stop trying to compete with your neighbor. Stop trying to compete with your friends and acquaintances and instead focusing on remembering the Lord. Focus on remembering the Lord your God, okay? They've got chariots. We have the Lord. Put into today's vernacular, Jay-Z's got a Maybach and I've got Jesus. The question for you is this, is he enough? Is Jesus enough for you? We remember the Lord our God. Together, feel it, we remember Jesus. This is why you keep going to church, okay? Because together, we remember Jesus. You need to have close relationships with people who share your values. Okay, you need to have close relationships with people who remember Jesus. Yes, there's a strong evangelistic, there's a strong missional call on Christians, and yes, we walk that out. Yes, we do. And we maintain a close network of people who we would call in a disaster who remember Jesus with us. This, other than you know, going to experience God in the context of corporate worship, is one of the only reasons I can think of for going to and growing your local church. I can think of three reasons. One, to hear good, faithful Bible preaching about Jesus. Two, to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in the context of corporate worship. And then three, to meet and build relationships with people who share your values, with people 
who will remember Jesus. That's why you build a church, so that more people can learn to remember Jesus. Why? So that when more people come, there's a greater pool of people for them to connect with in the hopes that they'll build lifelong relationships with people who are similar to them, who share their core value of remembering Jesus. This is why we need to have churches, so that we can fill them with people who remember Jesus. What's the difference between us and them? Okay, I want to say it's not our relative sinlessness, because from week to week, you may be somewhere between axe murderer and red light runner. You're going to be somewhere on that spectrum. Never will you find yourself sinless. It can't be about your relative piousness, because how can you pretend to be pious when you're somewhere on the spectrum between axe murderer and red light runner? Okay, it's certainly not about clean living this because we know that whether you're an axe murderer or a red light runner, you have dirty hands, just like me. Okay, the difference is not these relative measurements of sinfulness or sinlessness. The difference is we remember Jesus. And the results, well, they speak for themselves. Look at verse 8. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. This is beautiful. They have bowed down and fallen. What they're saying here is that the battle has laid them low. Have you noticed that everyone is grumpy? I was just out buying lunch just now before I came to preach this sermon. Everybody in line is grumpy. Everybody behind the counter is grumpy. Sometimes I just want to stop and shout and say, why are all you people so upset? And the thing that's interesting is if I actually had the opportunity to sit down with them, they would have very good reasons. They would have marriages that are falling apart. They would have bank accounts that are on the verge of snapping. They would have children who are out of control. They would have unfulfilled hopes and dreams festering in their hearts. They would have abuse in their backgrounds and broken families in their backgrounds and tragedy in their backgrounds. And their mom has just been diagnosed with cancer. And they have just been diagnosed with leukemia. God knows what these people are dealing with. Everybody who's grumpy has a very good reason to be grumpy. Okay, have you noticed though that everybody, like everybody drives angry. I'm driving and people just randomly, just randomly cutting me off for no reason. Why? Well, because they think they're better than me and it's okay for them to cut me off. Uh, it's just everyone is doing the same thing because everyone is basically their own God because we live in an age of sec secular humanism when everyone's a pluralist and everyone's following their own bliss. And if their bliss happens to be cutting me off, well, they're going to follow that, right? Everyone is grumpy. Everyone's mad. Everyone is upset. But the Christian can stand in the midst of the storm the Christian can face that same diagnosis. The Christian can face that same angry driver cutting them off. That Christian can face that same broken marriage. That Christian can face that same sick child, and it will not destroy them. Why? Because we remember Jesus. Okay, nothing proves this like the way in which we face death. Okay? Sense versus senselessness. In high school, one of the girls in my grade was killed in a tragic boating accident. I'll never forget her funeral. The whole school was there, and it was just the most depressing service you could ever imagine, because how can you make sense out of a 16-year-old whose life is snuffed out like that? Then we have my brother-in-law's funeral three years ago, whose life was also snuffed out like that while he was working on the mission field, leaving my sister, his wife, and their three small children fatherless. How do you make sense of that? But I gotta say that his funeral was the opposite of despair. 2,000 people packed that church and blew the roof off the place in worship. Were they not sad? They were sad. Believe me, as we carried his casket up that aisle, we were all bawling our eyes. Yes, we were sad, but were we in despair? Are we three years later in despair? Absolutely not. What's the difference? Jesus is the difference. We buried my grandmother two weeks ago, and we watched her decline over 10 days, and we sat at her deathbed. And I got to say, sitting in that ward where everyone is dying is very depressing. But my grandmother's room was not depressing. Why? Because my mom and my dad and my sister and me and my grandpa spent the vigil worshiping Jesus. Sometimes the presence of the Spirit was so strong in the room that I could hardly sing for weeping. And we were the only room in the place from which worship music was emanating. Does it stand to reason, therefore, that our room was the only room on the palliative ward that was not fallen into despair? Yes, our room was the only room in the palliative floor that had not fallen into despair. Why? Because we're better people than everyone else? Absolutely not. Because we remember Jesus. Okay, we remember Jesus. Materialists are going to have no hope 
when disaster strikes. Why? Because your BMW doesn't run so well in a flood. Okay, it just doesn't work in a flood. But believers will be back in the ruins of their church in coastal Alabama the Sunday after Hurricane Katrina hits, worshiping Jesus with hands raised and no roof to shelter them. Because Jesus is the God of the storms, and he is no stranger to suffering himself. And if you find yourself in a situation that is so bad that all you can muster is the weakest of weak faiths, I got to say to you, that is perfectly all right. Why? Look at verse 8. But we have risen and stand upright. Man, that verse will preach. But we have risen and stand upright. Do you notice that the singers are singing this on the eve of a battle that hasn't happened yet? And yet they are declaring it as if it has powerful but we have risen and stand upright that is faith now let me tell you what the best thing is about declarative faith that's what that is that's declarative faith they're declaring something that hasn't happened yet but we have risen and stand upright and they haven't even gone to battle yet the best thing about declarative faith is that in the years that follow upon that declarative moment you will look back and say remember that time that god saved us Remember that time that God saved us? Do we have any reason to think that he won't do it again? And the very fact that I'm here preaching from Psalm 20, thousands of years after Psalm 20 was written, is proof that the promise in Psalm 20 was true. Because those soldiers didn't all die the next day. Otherwise, we never would have had a record of this song. King David's kingdom persevered after the events recorded in this psalm because God saved them. Okay, the Bible proves itself true in and of itself. You will look back on this time and you will say, God saved me. And because God saved me then, I know that he will save me now. Dude, this is why, hear me, this is why faithless people get more and more faithless over time. And this is why faithful people get more and more filled with faith as they age with God because they are constantly making deposits in the faith bank. They are declaring in faith that God will save them on the morrow, even though they're not sure how it's going to go. And when God does save them, then 10 years from now, they look back and they say, God saved me then, he'll save me again. And as you build that up over time and over time and over time, you turn into a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old or a 90-year-old who's on their deathbed who is not afraid because you have learned from experience that God is good. Is your day-to-day -day experience a Christian one? Or isn't it? Okay, please don't kid yourself. Be brutally honest. Is your day-to-day -day experience a Christian one? Or isn't it? Because you're either looking to God as Savior or you're not. Look at verse 9. Save, Lord. May the King answer us when we call. This is one of those examples where the English translation gets it completely wrong. I actually checked the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the original Hebrew, and it agrees with me here. In the Hebrew, that sentence, Save, Lord, may the king answer when we call, reads this way, Adonai hoshia hamelech ya'anenu beyom kra'enu, which means literally, God save the king. Okay, Adonai hoshia hamelech, God save the king. He will answer us in the day of our cry. Okay, it's radically different. In the English, as we have it, it says, Save, Lord, may the king answer us when we call. No, no, no. In the Hebrew, God save the king. He, meaning God, will answer us in the day of our cry. Simply put, what are they declaring here? If the king lives, we live. If the king lives, we live live and i must because i'm a christian preacher make an unmistakable connection to jesus here i'm going to read to you out of first corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 23 now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead but if there is no resurrection of the dead then christ is not risen and if christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have just perished. They've died. 
If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. My dear friend from many years ago, Rick McKinley, pastors a great church in Portland, Oregon, posted something very simple on his Twitter feed this weekend. He said this, if Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, then everything he said is true. If he isn't, then do whatever you want. It really comes down to Jesus and whether or not he rose again from death. If the king lives, we live. If the king is risen, we too will rise. They were singing it about King David. We sing it about King Jesus. If the king lives, we live. If the king lives, we live. It's as simple as that. So while we wait and suffer and live, sometimes in joy, Sometimes in fear and sorrow, we keep crying out because He will answer us when we call. Because ultimately, in your life, God is the one who should get the last word.